<laughs> Once upon a Christmas on a mountain up high, there was a devilish cad whose scheme was quite sly. His name was Dr. Wolfula. He sought Christmas's end. He stole all the town's gifts off the peak he would send, plummeting down the ground below with the town's Christmas dreams forgotten in snow. Doc thought after his long winter climb that his plan was original, clever, and bold, but it's been done in fiction many a time. Of this fact, his minion goulash had never told. It's so fucking cold. Quit complaining! The doctor did scold. Where's that voice coming from? Voice? Uh, never mind. Season's greetings. I'm your host, Dr. Wolfula, and when I'm not stealing Christmas and actually succeeding this time, I'm here at the top of this random mountain riff viewing movies. Yes, you heard it right. I actually stole Christmas, the first one to ever do it. What about the Grinch? What are you talking about, Goulash? You know, that green guy who stole Christmas. Are you talking about yourself, Goulash? Because you aren't getting any credit for this, Goulash. This was all my idea. No, sir, the Grinch is that Dr. Seuss character. Oh, yeah, fuck. I really thought I was cooking with this idea. But speaking of plagiarism, to pass the time until dawn arrives, I might as well riff you the mean one, a horror movie about a Grinchy fellow who tries to ruin Christmas. B but don't actually say Grinch or you'll get sued. <laughs> First, though, why don't we go into the history of the Grinch, sir? Oh, I forgot your channel, The Gulag, talks about kids' movies and shit. Fine, we'll talk about the Grinch media that came before, but if you folks at home just want to watch my mean one riff you, skip to this time code. Take it from here, Goulash. Oh, uh, hey, Goulash here. The Grinch began as the brainchild of Theodore Seuss Geisel, better known as Dr. Seuss. Nobody ever calls him out for not being a real doctor. Yes, well, Grinch appeared in a couple different forms in Dr. Seuss stories over the years before finally appearing in his most famous incarnation in the classic storybook How the Grinch Stole Christmas in 1957. The Grinch was partially based on Dr. Seuss himself. After one Christmas, Seuss looked in the mirror and saw that he had the look of a miser, a Grinch, and realized that with all the commercialization of Christmas, he had lost sight of what the holiday was really about, and sought to write a story that would help him undo his own Grinchiness. I don't know why he wouldn't have just stolen Christmas himself. He had a good idea there, and he wasted it on a kid's book. Every who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot, but the Grinch did not. How the Grinch Stole Christmas's story is iconic and stands as one of Dr. Seuss's greatest triumphs through its simplicity and wide appeal as a Christmas season perennial. Every official adaptation of How the Grinch Stole Christmas hews closely to the original book, only really straying from the narrative in terms of adding flourishes to the plot. If it works, it works. Why did the Grinch hate Christmas? Where did it all start? You probably already know the plot of How the Grinch Stole Christmas, but let's just break it down real quick. A green, middle-aged hermit named the Grinch, who lives on a mountain, hates Christmas and decides to end it by stealing the nearby town of Whoville's stuff on Christmas Eve. To achieve this goal, the Grinch dresses up as Santa, with his dog Max playing the role of a reindeer. The Grinch is briefly shaken in his mission by a little girl named Cindy Lou Who, but the Grinch eventually succeeds in his goal of stealing all of Whoville's possessions and prepares to chuck them off the side of a mountain. When he sees that the town of Whoville still celebrates the holiday together, even after losing everything, causing Grinch to realize that Christmas is much more than just materialism, and returns everything to the town, with the Grinch welcome to celebrate his first Christmas. Christmas is mainly about materialism, but it can be about so many other things too. But it is mainly about materialism. Maybe Christmas perhaps means a little bit more. After nearly a decade in print, famed Looney Tunes animator Chuck Jones approached Dr. Seuss to adapt How the Grinch Stole Christmas into an animated special in 1966. The previous year saw the release of the first ever Peanuts animated special, A Charlie Brown Christmas, the golden child of Christmas specials, and the year before it, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, and Chuck Jones saw an opportunity to turn the Grinch into the next big holiday star. I know just what to do. The Grinch laughed in his throat. To set Dr. Seuss's mind at ease that the special wouldn't tarnish the name of the original book, Seuss was given creative control and a budget of $300,000, nearly $3 million today. A an unheard of budget for a half hour of animation. This was still the early days of TV animation. The original Grinch special might not seem all that impressive today, but it was truly an achievement for TV animation, which tended to be cruder, stiffer, simpler, and cheaper compared to the theatrical animated shorts that preceded it. Not again. 
I mean, look at a Charlie Brown Christmas a year before Grinch. The animation is cute and charming, but it's pretty basic looking, especially compared to Chuck Jones's work on The Grinch. <laughs> The Grinch special saw Chuck Jones bring his theatrical short style to the small screen, seamlessly blending together his own sensibilities as an animator with Dr. Seuss's uniquely off-kilter art style, bringing color to the original story of The Grinch, establishing for the first time that the old miser is green. It's a color that really works. Fucking worst color ever. Uh, well, I like it. The Grinch himself was voiced with menace by horror icon Boris Karloff, who also narrated the special. But for 53 years, I put up with it now. Karloff managed to stay relevant when so many of his peers faded away by adapting to the new medium of TV, being embraced by another generation. Why are you taking our Christmas tree? Why? Veteran voice actress June Foray also played Cindy Lou Who. You might know her better as the voice of Granny from Looney Tunes or Rocket J. Squirrel. I could fly if I had to. The only major departures from the book are the three songs Seuss wrote for the special, most notably the Grinch's iconic theme music, You're a Mean One, Mr. Grinch, sung by Thurl Ravenscroft. Thurl Ravenscroft? That's a fucking badass name. You're a mean one, Mr. Grinch. The How the Grinch Stole Christmas special was a major hit, though it was never able to eclipse Charlie Brown Christmas in ratings, but it has endured as one of the most popular Christmas specials of all time and led to Dr. Seuss reaching a wider audience through TV. Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And spawned two sequel specials, the psychedelic bad acid trip Halloween is Grinch Night. I like you much better with my glasses off. You put your glasses back on and face the facts. And the crossover, the Grinch Grinches, the cat in the hat. Green face? Green face? Some fun trivia about Dr. Seuss I learned. A year after the Grinch special aired, Dr. Seuss's wife Helen committed suicide after she suffered from illnesses and cancer for 13 years, and she discovered that her husband Dr. Seuss was cheating on her with a woman 20 years younger, who Dr. Seuss married after his first wife Helen killed herself. That isn't fun trivia! It makes Dr. Seuss sound like a fucking monster! I thought it was fun trivia. Uh, Dr. Seuss eventually turned it into a book. Oh, the mistresses you'll see. I wouldn't touch you with a 39 and a half foot pole. Okay, well, Dr. Seuss refused to allow his creations to be milked for movies and merchandise during his life. So, of course, when Dr. Seuss did die in 1991, his widow and former mistress, Audrey, started milking his creations for all they were worth and began putting the live-action film rights for Seuss's books on auction in the late 90s, starting with The Grinch. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. All the major Hollywood studios were desperate to snatch up The Grinch for themselves, but winning the rights to the Grinch wasn't just a matter of money, though the price was steep. Audrey Geisel had to be paid five million dollars up front. She had to be given a cut of all box office and merchandise profits, and the film had to have a major star and a major director attached ahead of time. The competing studios were willing to accommodate the Seuss widow's demands, of course, so her choice of who'd adapt the Grinch on film came down to who'd deliver the best pitch for the adaptation. Among the producers trying to claim the Grinch rights was old crazy hair himself, Brian Grazer, and he realized he couldn't do it without his producing partner, old no-hair Ron Howard, brother of Clint Howard of Silent Night, Deadly Night 4 fame. God, he still fucking scares me. Action! Ron Howard wasn't initially interested in directing a Grinch film, but he came up with a concept on how to make the Grinch work in a full-length movie, by expanding the role of the Cindy Lou Who character and expanding the Grinch's origin story. Don't they know that the more we know about the Grinch, the less afraid of him we'll be? Well, Ron Howard still managed to make a scary fucking Grinch movie. The teaser trailer they released for it made it look like a Nightmare on Elm Street film. <laughs> The Grinch! Jim Carrey was one of Audrey Geisel's first choices for The Grinch while auctioning off the film rights, and he landed the title role in the big-budget adaptation. Universal was pensive about spending $20 million to hire Jim Carrey when his face would be heavily covered in makeup, so they initially tried to have makeup effects guru Rick Baker tone the makeup down. But Universal eventually relented when it became apparent that even if you can't tell it's Jim Carrey based on appearance, the performance is unmistakably Jim Carrey. It's Jim Carrey at his Jim Carreyist. I'm a psycho. 
<laughs> Which is impressive considering how brutal it was to wear the heavy makeup and suit designed by Rick Baker that totally transformed Carrie's appearance into a frightening green monster. At the same time, it's hard to feel bad about Jim Carrey wearing all that shit when he was paid $20 million to do it. Nobody had a gun to your head, homie. I was buried, you know? Jim Carrey is safely the highlight of Ron Howard's Grinch, but it feels like the actor himself overshadows the film's story to the point where it's mainly just a series of Jim Carrey gags within the framework of a classic Christmas tale. Am I just eating because I'm bored? The 2000 film is pretty funny, but the wacky, irreverent, relatable portrayal of the Grinch is a huge departure from the source material, feeling like it was preparing us for Shrek the following year. And I don't think Dr. Seuss would have approved of it, but at the same time, he was a guy who cheated on his dying wife, so I guess who really cares what he would fucking think? Audrey Geisel shot down a lot of edgy adult jokes for the 2000 Grinch film, but it still manages to have a lot of edgy adult jokes in it, and it's pretty damn horny too, with gags of implied who cuckoldry. Hey honey, our baby's here! He looks just like your boss. Who key party orgies, and it includes a love interest for the Grinch, Martha May Huvier, who the Grinch is reunited with after 45 years by flying into her cleavage. Hello, Martha. <gasps> Oh fuck, Martha May Huvier. The things I would do to her. Call me Santa because I definitely would like to stuff her stocking this year. Okay, okay, I get it. Ugh. The muscles. The 2000 Grinch is also just garish to look at at times. The ugly sweater of Christmas movies. It also doesn't help that Clint Howard's in this film. The ugly sweater of actors. The world of Whoville is vividly and creatively rendered in live-action detail for the film, but the Who's populating the streets of Whoville are pretty creepy with bulbous noses and huge upper lips. I don't necessarily think they needed to distort the actors' physical appearances to make them Who's. Just give them weird hairdos and outfits, but it was almost going to be much worse. The original idea was for the Who's to be totally inhuman creatures like the Grinch himself, and the results are truly horrific. Oh god, what the fuck? Yeah, but the film still manages to cram in some traumatizing effects with the animatronic baby Grinch that will forever haunt my dreams. <laughs> the live-action Grinch is pretty hideous, but in a kind of fun, campy way, and it's pretty funny. This is not pudding. What? It's also cool to hear Anthony Hopkins as the narrator, kind of a modern equivalent to Boris Karloff. The Grinch got a wonderful, awful idea. But what ultimately brings the movie down, especially on rewatches, is that it's really padded out. It's adapting a 64-page book with a simple story, so of course it needs to add a lot to the story, but it all feels... Superfluous? Thank you, Cindy Lou Who. It's a slow movie. It takes an hour for it to get to where the book actually begins, and the build-up to that is a lot of directionless gags, and a Cindy Lou Who plot where she learns about the Grinch's traumatic childhood bullied during Christmas time, and Cindy tries to force the Grinch to face his trauma in the most overstimulating, traumatic ways imaginable. I could hang myself with all the bad Christmas neckties I found at the dump! The ending of the film is interminable, too, just because of how slowly it plays out as the Who's themselves have to learn to reject the materialism of Christmas. You can't hurt Christmas, Mr. Mayor. That, that's what Cindy's been trying to tell everyone. The movie is a guilty pleasure to watch, but there are parts that just drag on, especially in the first hour and the last 20 minutes. The original special is so much more enjoyable to watch without all the extra frills. It's short and sweet, straight to the point. Yeah, for a movie so wild and energetic, it does kind of make me want to take a nap when I watch it. And speaking of movies that make you want to take a nap, eventually Universal was feeling that Grinchy greed again when they decided to double dip on the Grinch, putting Illumination, the animation masterminds behind those fucking Minions flicks to work on a new take on the Grinch. And it's a testament to Illumination's ability to make the safest, lowest common denominator animated movies imaginable. Max! What is this depressing bean? The 2018 Grinch isn't a terrible film. Its problem is that it's just a nothing movie. I've seen it twice, and I couldn't really tell you what happens in the first half of the film. It's just an incredibly unremarkable, unmemorable animated movie. Apologize for that. My eyes are burning. 
Illumination is in the market of making animated films that are as safe as possible, and this Grinch movie is the ultimate example of that. There's nothing offensive about it that a parent could get mad at, but that's just because there's nothing in the movie that would garner any reaction whatsoever beyond a shrug. I must stop this Christmas from coming. The Grinch as played by Benedict Cumberbatch is a massive miscalculation. He isn't some evil hermit, he's just kind of a dickish recluse who hates Christmas because he was an orphan and was jealous of the kids with parents. He's just too toned down and sympathetic. The characters take any poor behavior the Grinch displays in stride and- Oh, sugar plum. Cumberbatch phones his performance in with a voiceover that sounds like the kind of voice Dave Chappelle would do when he's playing a white guy. Bought enough food to last until January. How much emotional eating have I been doing? Dave. Dave. It's the goddamn cops. I'm gonna ask him for directions. Before reaching the actual plot of the book where the Grinch steals Christmas, it just feels like a series of random things happening. Something having to do with the Cindy Lou Who character, I truly don't know. There's a fat reindeer in there for some reason, just to have another cute animal besides Max, but it's all impossible to be engaged with beyond maybe thinking it looks cute. Are you going somewhere? North Pole! The animation is bright and vibrant, but the execution of the Grinch's world of Whoville is bland. It barely feels like a movie inspired by Dr. Seuss. The film also has questionable song choices like a Trap House cover of You're a Mean One. Yo mean one, you really are a heel. And Pharrell for some reason is the narrator of the film with a performance that's even more phoned in than Cumberbatch's. Only it's not a dream, it is Christmas in Whoville. These flourishes feel out of place in such a white bread, lame version of The Grinch. Like Universal's cynical, lazy attempt to appeal to an African American audience at the last minute. You have all the bit of sweetness of a seasick crocodile. The 2018 Grinch might be entertaining to a child, but I don't know. I could see what a kid could get out of something like a Minions movie, but that isn't really here in this Grinch movie. So I have no idea what a kid could get out of it. I guess it's cute, that's gotta count for something with these dime a dozen CG animated flicks, but it just isn't fun to watch. It's a movie to put on for your kids to shut them up for an hour and a half while you're wrapping their gifts. Not something that was meant to have any lasting impact like previous adaptations of the Grinch story. Which is probably good for Universal when they make another Grinch movie, I guess. This was the last Seuss film released in the lifetime of his widow slash former mistress Audrey Geisel. She passed away a few weeks after the film premiered, and I don't fucking blame her. I stole your Christmas because I thought it would fix something that happened a long time ago. This 2018 Grinch is a movie you can easily skip during Christmas. Stick to the original special if you want to show your kids an animated Grinch. Alright, okay. Goulash, we're caught up in all the Grinch shit from the past. Now it's time for me to take over. Season's greetings. I'm your host, Dr. Wolfie with a riff view of The Mean One, released in 2022. With David Howard Thornton of Art the Clown fame in the title role of a totally unauthorized slasher film inspired by The Grinch, but not explicitly related to The Grinch to avoid potential legal reprisals. Earlier this year, we saw a Winnie the Pooh slasher film that could totally say it was a Winnie the Pooh movie, of course, but that was because Winnie the Pooh had just entered the public domain, meaning anybody could do anything with that character. But Grinch is still copyrighted for at least another 30 years, so the mean one has to skirt around its direct connections to its source material. And there's nothing scarier than a horror movie that's afraid to get sued. Here's my riff view of The Mean One. But first I have a message from my sponsor. Me! Pledge to my Patreon today to support the channel, help it continue to grow, and you'll also get access to weekly movie nights every Sunday and archive commentaries if you miss the movie nights live. Just five bucks a month to get a movie night every week. Pledge to patreon.com slash drwolfula if you're interested, and I thank you in advance. <laughs> the Mean One's opening logos let us know that it's brought to us by a production company named after a Sonic the Hedgehog character. I'm already scared. The opening shots of The Mean One establishing its setting are comprised entirely of stock footage, and I'm not kidding about that. I was able to easily find the stock footage they used on Pond 5. This shot only cost $80. Remember that story about Cindy you know who? The film itself is narrated by a guy who sounds like he's doing a Malcolm McDowell impression. When her Christmas was stolen, she knew what to do. And when your movie can't even afford Malcolm McDowell to do a voiceover in it, money has to be tight. Malcolm McDowell will appear in a movie in exchange for a handful of Skittles, for God's sake. When I want your opinion, I'll beat it out of you. The movie attempts to describe the original account of events in the book it's ripping off. Why, Santa Claus? Why? 
but it's not at all like how the book goes down. But in the defense of the filmmakers, the book was 64 pages long, with about a sentence per page. So I can understand if they couldn't be bothered to read. That one simple kiss made his heart grow three sizes. They don't need to read the book anyway, because they have a more twisted take on what happens in the actual movie. Oh, get away from my daughter! What if Cindy's mother intervened, and in self-defense, this grinchy fellow did something hasty? She could have survived this if she had just gotten a tetanus shot. Monster! Cindy's handling her mother dying pretty well. Another little girl would probably be crying and shit. After whatever the hell that cold open was, we get even more stock footage as we finally get to the opening credits. Really? That's the font you're going with for your Grinch horror movie? Really? Okay. We jump ahead 20 years later as we meet an adult Cindy who's still a brunette because blonde hair was copyrighted by Dr. Seuss. She looks like Alice Lowe. Dr. Brain thinks I need to do this. Cindy's returning to her hometown of Newville with her father as exposure therapy during Christmas time to help her move on from the murder of her mother. I don't know why Cindy is so hung up on that Christmas. She still got that Bratz doll she wanted. Maybe finally get some closure. Cindy and her father are pulled over by the 5-0, Deputy Burke here, who informs them that their car's decorations are a violation of the town's good taste laws. We don't allow those kinds of car decorations within the city limits. Burke was planning to arrest Cindy and her dad, but since they're white, he decides to let them go with a warning. He's cute. Oh my god. Your dad just wants to date him. If you won't move on, at least let him. Cindy and her dad return to their old home together, and that night, Cindy is plagued by a terrible nightmare of me groping her. Cindy? Wow, he was ready right away with that bat. What, was he waiting outside her bedroom with that thing? You see the monster again? Okay, this dad actor is maybe kissing his daughter's body a little too much. The next day at a diner, Cindy runs into Burke again, and his boss, Sheriff Hooper, who Cindy met on that faithful night 20 years ago. This is who you saw? Hurt mommy? Cindy's drawing of the mean one looks like he got his neck circumcised. In this flashback, the sheriff revealed that the mean one is really just a guy wearing a green gimp mask. Whoever did this must have dropped it. Did you ever find a Christmas killer? I'm sure if they caught your mother's killer, you would have heard about it, Cindy. Never got a reliable description of the man. Cindy's dad reveals that he can't find Christmas decorations for sale anywhere in town, and the sheriff is evasive as to why. Do you put up decorations? Oh, I like the candles eight nights a year. You're Jewish. Was it the nose? Yikes, dude. Come on, kiddo. Cindy and her dad decide to leave the diner because it's starting to become decidedly un -Aryan in this place. You've got to up your game, son. Back at home, Cindy's dad manages to find some decorations so they can get merry and quirky. That's not how you wear a hat. <laughs> <laughs> this tree cost the production $20 at Big Lots. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh, Cindy's dad is a laugh riot. I certainly hope he isn't brutally murdered in the next scene. <laughs> When Cindy takes out the garbage, inside, Dad meets the guy who nailed his wife 20 years ago. And the mean one gets up in Cindy's papa's guts and skull fucks him with a candy cane. <laughs> Luckily, it was all just a dream. The Cindy screaming part, at least. Her dad really is fucking dead, though. Look at this fucking hospital establishing shot. The text on the sign they photoshopped isn't even aligned with the perspective of the sign. Well, they make up for this by showing a fishbowl in the hospital with a red fish and a blue fish inside it. They were really hoping YouTubers would be making Dr. Seuss Easter eggs you missed in the mean one videos. A Santa suit. And green. Please don't think I'm crazy, please. Well, since you said please. While Cindy is traumatized in the hospital, she gets a visitor. Nice tits. Oh, but she's the mayor. Mayor McBean. I wouldn't mind flicking her McBean, if you know what I mean. That guy is still out there. What are you gonna do about it? Everything we can. The mayor tries to set Cindy's mind at ease, and it's really working well. What if it's coming to steal our Christmas? Later, Burke faces the mayor and asks how they should proceed with the investigation. So what do we do? Our jobs. Really? That's the take they went with? Our jobs! Cindy's released from the hospital and grieves at her father's really poorly photoshopped grave. So heartbreaking. Burke takes Cindy home from the funeral, and to remind us all that he's Jewish, he gives Cindy a thermos of matzo ball soup. Homemade matzo ball soup. Proudly Jewish. Totally forgot he was Jewish. Inside, Cindy is greeted by the sight of her father's blood stain. You know what can get your father's blood out of this hardwood floor? Fantastic all-purpose cleaner, with the scent you just know is fantastic. Whilst cleaning, Cindy finds on her floor a potion ingredient from Skyrim, 
and after a really weird website transition, Cindy heads to the location of the flower's origin. This movie was obviously shot in Southern California, but all you need to do to make us think it's the chilly north is cut away to stock footage of a mountain. While taking pictures of the mean one for the Daily Bugle, Cindy falls down into a cave and finds another Dr. Seuss Easter egg. Walter Mulberry. Of course, the book this Easter egg is referencing is now banned, so just pretend you didn't see it. Cindy climbs out of the cave and takes some creeper shots of an embracing couple, when she spots the mean one taking a few shots of the couple of his own. Cindy, realizing the mean one doesn't look scary at all, throws rocks at the green bitch like she's Macaulay Culkin in Home Alone 2. Yes, having the villain of your horror movie cowardly run away is a great method to make us fear him. Cindy tries to prove to the police that there's a monster up on the mountain, with a photo that makes the Patterson-Gimlin film look like it was shot by Roger Deakins in comparison. All monsters born blurry? You need to pull your head out of- Easy. The sand. They almost forgot this movie is G-rated. Because the sheriff won't believe her, Cindy puts up posters of her dark, blurry photo with an even vaguer caption. She's gonna get a lot of calls thinking she's advertising a furry convention. She's putting up flyers, for God's sake. Speaking of conventions, a van transporting a group of rowdy Santas and their slutty, slutty elf bitches passing through town for a convention storm a local diner where they can get really rapey around the lone waitress working inside. Huh, he must have eaten Chipotle earlier today. Wait a second, that's not the restroom! <laughs> The cringe, I mean the mean one, makes himself known to the uncouth diner patrons in a way that could have been amusingly cartoony if it was shot better. That Santa was gonna die in a gutter tonight anyway. He just sped the process up. The Santa's scatter and the hastily shot madness is underway as the mean one shows this Santa a magic trick. This slutty Mrs. Claus really thought standing on a table would be a good hiding place. And we've seen plenty of stock footage. How about some stock sound effects? <laughs> The mean one smashes this one bitch into nothing but a bloody wig, and the mean one gets hungry and makes himself some Arby's. Making me hungry! <laughs> Weeks later, Cindy is still putting up these fucking signs, expecting them to help her do anything. The sheriff puts a stop to this just because this bitch is wasting not only her time, but the time of anybody unlucky enough to be watching this movie. Take it down and go home. How can anyone put this photo on a poster and not feel like a fucking idiot hanging it up? Back at Cindy's house, her power goes out. Yeah, the mean one is really cramming all the cliche horror tropes into this one fucking movie. The mean one tries to break in, but he barely has the strength of one Grinch, let alone ten Grinches plus two. Cindy hides from the intruder, waiting to strike, only to find something more frightening than expected. An elderly drunk! Ah! You got anything to drink? Oh, Hortons. <laughs> I get it. Oh, they serve a scotch called Geisel. I also get that. <laughs> uh. At the bar, the old drunk hands Cindy a sketch of the monster that's been hounding her. That's just an actual drawing of the Jim Carrey Grinch. What is it? The Grinch! Order for my bitch! If that bitch just let him say Grinch, they wouldn't have been able to release this awful movie. But to me... He's just the mean one. Yeah, that's the uncopyrighted name we're allowed to call him. Us folks down in Newville, we liked Christmas a lot. Through ripping off some Dr. Seuss verse, the old man reveals that the reason why the town doesn't celebrate Christmas is because the mean one kills anybody engaging in holly or jolly activities. Eleven years ago. And the ancient alcoholic reveals that over a decade ago, while his wife was carrying Christmas gifts, the mean one split this gilf in half, which is also my last Pornhub search. He's a mean one, that Mr. Bitch! Okay, we get it. You can't say Grinch. It wasn't funny the first fucking time. His heart is an empty hole. If only somebody grew three sizes to fill that empty hole. Cindy tries one last time to get the cops to cooperate, but even at her most Karen, no luck. Get out. Now! But Burke volunteers to investigate the mountain by himself. How about I head up to the mountain? I'll let you know what I find. And he manages to let a scene go by without making a single allusion to being Jewish. Bert goes spelunking down into a cave and finds a whole bunch of wallets to pocket. Score! Underneath a blanket, though, Burke discovers the remains of Danny Trejo! Oh no! Bert gets the hell out of there, but runs into something more frightening than the mean one. An old person! 
Who are you? Matthias Zeus. Well, everybody calls me Doc. So, his name is Dr. Zeus? Okay, now this movie's really starting to irritate me. You have no idea what you're hunting up here, do you? No. Burke reports back to Sydney with all the wallets belonging to the missing people he found, with the cash inside them conspicuously absent. Your boss thinks I'm whacked. He's a good man. You're a forgiving soul. Jewish. Okay, we get it, you're Jewish. Quit bringing it up all the time. Jewish. How's that working out for you? Historically. Oh no, Sydney's gonna talk about the Holocaust, isn't she? I'm not Jewish. Oh, well, there's hope for you yet. He makes being Jewish sound like being a Jedi. <laughs> you smuck. <laughs> I'm sorry, can I say that? Man, Mein Kampf is less anti-Semitic than this fucking movie. Later, because this film needs to cover every horror cliche, Cindy has a shower scene, and it's like watching her aunt take a shower. But she has some company. God, these two really should be focusing on the bathing aspect of this activity. The mean one arrives to turn this into a threesome, but he likes the rough stuff. <laughs> oh, I guess it was just a wet dream. Cindy decides she just needs to kill the mean one herself. And you know what that means, right? Training montage! Punching a green lawn decoration and firing a gun gradually transforms Cindy into Ronda Rousey, I guess. Is it even still December at this point? How much time has been passing? <laughs> While all this is going on, Burke reminisces over Kid Cindy's poor drawing of the mean one. Looks like a fucking ostrich. Later that night at a diner... Okay, how many fucking diners are in this movie? Why are the locations in this movie always some different diner? Pick a different location already. Anyway, the proprietor of the diner has a problem on his hands. His bell pepper shipment got mixed up with a jingle bell shipment. I ordered bell peppers, not jingle bells. Ah, oh, such a classic shipping blunder. Always so inconvenient. Especially when it makes you the target of some deviant art persona. Ah! He cut through his head, he made him quite dead. That mean one cared not a sliver. For Christmas, the man's noggin he'd very soon deliver. Oh, fuck, I'm speaking in rhyme. I hope it's not permanent. I can't do this all the time. Ah! After months of training during December, Cindy realizes why the mean one is so mean. Maybe his heart is two sizes too small. This movie thinks its audience is laughing with it, but they're really laughing at it. Deputy Burke arrives to give Cindy an update on his research. He discovered that all the missing hikers on the mountain were really killed by the mean one. Whoa, what a revelation one hour into a movie where we've already been seeing the mean one murdering a dozen people. Totally thought those other murders had to be unrelated, though. He hates Christmas. Mayor McBean, who seemed so innocent before, has been the one luring hikers to the mean one's mountain. She's been luring these people to their death. I mean, she could have just been trying to drive up tourism to her town, but, but whatever. Elsewhere, yeah, Mayor McBean is skipping town because she's been luring people to their deaths. And because this film is nothing but a series of slasher movie cliches duct taped together with a vague association with Dr. Seuss, the mayor's car suddenly breaks down in the middle of nowhere. That's the worst place to break down at. <laughs> The mean one gives Mayor McBean a good old flickin', a little love bite, and lets her know she's got his vote. You already decapitated someone, mean one! Get some new material! Burke confronts his boss about the mayor's conspiracy, and the sheriff reveals ever since he saw a green furry giving a girl a hickey inside a dark cave, the sheriff has been trying to keep the mean one's hunger in check like it's the T-Rex from Jurassic Park, instead of just using his gun to solve the problem. People are dying. Not my people! Bert goes hunting for the mean one up on the mountain and just can't resist an opportunity to remind us he's Jewish. Dreidel, 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 I made it out of clay. Okay, we get it. <laughs> Burke falls into the mean one's trap, but the worst part about living in a cave is that it gets awfully lonely down there. <sighs> After shrugging off two gunshots, the mean one endeavors to uh, run away again. Such a fucking lame monster. What are you doing? I took an oath to protect this town. The sheriff heads deeper into the cave to finish off the emerald green coward, only to end up with the mean one biting his dick off. He knew. <laughs> they don't show what happened, so I'm just gonna assume he got his dick bit off. With the sheriff dead and Burke out of commission, Cindy's determined to take down the mean one herself. Time to roast this beast. After this video, I really need to hang myself with some Christmas lights. 
Cindy lights her house up, and after he finishes chowing down on what remains of the sheriff's cock and balls, the mean one slides down Cindy's chimney, but I'm sure he's not the first guy to do that. <laughs> guess who? Before he has a chance to guess foot in the crotch, he gets blasted away by a belligerent drunk sniper. Merry Christmas, you green bitch! But the mean one, like Santa, can get from place to place pretty fast. <laughs> That's our villain, folks, running away again. Get back, you're exposed out here. Cindy leaves the old man behind to take a nap, hopefully a permanent one, and Cindy beats the fuck out of the mean one with a festivus pole and blows the green Nancy boy's jingle balls off. But one shitty looking CGI explosion isn't enough. Let's go two for two. Before Cindy can finally cut this green asshole's throat and end this fucking movie, it's revealed that the mean one kept the necklace Cindy gave to him, and that he didn't mean to kill Cindy's mother, but because Cindy perceived the mean one as a monster, he became one. So, in a way, that makes Cindy the real villain of the film, and responsible for hundreds of deaths. What a bitch. Bitch or not, though, Cindy forgives the mean one, and in Newville, they say, his heart grew three sizes that day. And it blew up inside his chest cavity. Savage as fuck! We know that his heart grew three sizes that day. The mean one's photo ends up leaking online, and he becomes a viral sensation like Gangnam Style or Chocolate Rain. Is it real? Is it fake? <laughs> Like some Bigfoot in the snow. I mean, okay, that's a drawing of a dick. And the town returns to celebrating Christmas, which is illustrated with a series of shots composed entirely of stock footage, of course. If they waited another year, they would have just made this entire movie with AI. Has Christmas returned almost overnight? Sydney ends up romantically involved with Burke, and hey, Doc Zeus survived too. Thank goodness, he had a lot to live for as an old alcoholic. I bet there's a parallel universe somewhere where the story's a lot more fun. I wish we were in that one. The movie really ends with the characters wishing they were in a better movie. Wow. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Whoa, this guy was Jewish the whole time? The scariest thing about this movie is the narrator threatens us with a sequel. And they all lived happily ever after. At least till next year. I really don't want to live in the universe where there's a mean two. <laughs> The mean one is a bad one, Mr. Grinch. It doesn't do anything clever in its reimagination of the Grinch as a horror movie. It's just a straightforward slasher film with a guy cosplaying as the Grinch. David Howard Thornton does the best he can in the role of the mean one, conjuring up a darker version of Jim Carrey's Grinch performance, but the guy doesn't have much to work with since the mean one is relegated to a mute, mindless monster. It could have been more like a wisecracking Freddy Krueger character, and he could have had some kind of vicious dog sidekick in the role of Max, something to make it more true to the source material and liven the movie up. It feels like they just wanted to typecast the guy into playing a green version of Art the Clown. The filmmakers just don't rise to the occasion. They can't match David Howard Thornton's enthusiasm for the role. He does the best he can within the parameters to make this feel like a Grinch horror movie with his campy, cartoony body language, but the weak theming of the script, the static camera work, and the overuse of stock footage and computer-generated gore all really hold the mean one back from being anything more than a somewhat amusing holiday novelty you may Maybe watch once out of curiosity. I give the mean one Cindy's drawing of the mean one out of Doc Zeus's drawing of the mean one. Dawn has finally arrived, Goulash. The people in town are just waking up. They're finding out now that no Christmas is coming. Their mouths will hang open for a minute or two, and then they'll all cry boo-hoo. That's a noise that I simply must hear. Sir, we're up on top of a mountain. It's impossible for us to hear anything down there. Give it a moment, Goulash. Okay, you're right. I can't hear anything. I think I can see somebody crying, though. I think. You know, sir, we had our fun, but maybe we should give the town its stuff back. What? Why? I don't know. It'd be nice. Dude, shut the fuck up with that shit. Wait. I think I can hear some boo-hooing. That's not boo-hooing. It's the cops. How'd they drive their cars up this mountain? Who cares? Let's just get out of here. Wait for me, Gulash. Ah! This is the worst Christmas ever! It truly was the worst Christmas ever, for Dr. Wolfula at least. For his crimes against the town, they roasted this beast. Merry Christmas to you, Merry Christmas from me. A creepy disembodied voice that you can't even see. Christmas, we became the 
This video is made possible through the pledges of my Patreon supporters, and I'd like to give a very special thanks to the kind folks pledged to my shoutouts tier. All of the support on Patreon means a lot to me, and it helps my dark influence continue to grow. If you like this video, like it, and if you loved it, click the subscribe and bell buttons for more vids. Be sure to also keep in touch by following me on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Dr. Wolfula. While I still have your attention, consider pledging to my Patreon to support the channel and get bonus content like previews, VIP Discord server access, private movie night streams, and credits in videos. Consider pledging at patreon.com slash drwolfula. Also, check out official Dr. Wolfula t-shirts and other merch on tpublic.com slash user slash drwolfula. Thanks for watching. See you all next time. Dr. Wolfula signing out. Bye.